Hello everyone and welcome to this session on serverless computing by IntelliPad. With the rise in cloud computing technology, it's been easier to work on a single server, but the price of maintaining the hardware and other resources is increasing a lot. That all changed when cloud vendors successfully began offering serverless computing solutions that were able to provide all the hardware and software resources needed to develop apps. Serverless computing allows developers to write and deploy code without having to manage the underlying infrastructure. In this session, you will learn all about serverless computing. So without further wait, let's start the session. But before we begin the session, make sure to subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you'll never miss any update from us. The agenda for today's video will be the following topics. Firstly, I'll be introducing the term serverless computing, what it is, how it came about, all that stuff and next I'll move on to the need for serverless computing or why do we use serverless computing. Next we'll move on to use cases and next we'll move on to the advantages of serverless computing and finally uh, we'll see what's next in store for serverless computing or what does the future hold for serverless computing. Now without any further ado let's get into the video. Introduction Serverless computing is a method of providing backend services on an as-use basis or a pay-as-you-go model. A serverless provider allows their users to write and deploy their code without the hassle of worrying about the underlying infrastructure. Here, uh, the term serverless is somewhat misleading as there are still servers providing these backend services, but all of the server space and infrastructure concerns are handled by the cloud vendor. Serverless means that the developers can do their work without having to worry about the servers at all. Now let us move to the next aspect of uh, serverless computing that is FAAS is the core of serverless computing. Here FAAS also known as function as a service and this is a type of cloud computing service that allows you to execute code in response to events without the complex infrastructure typically associated with building and launching microservice applications. What this means in other words uh, is that uh, the cloud provider uh, basically gives a service wherein you just write the code or the function in this case and put it up on that service and you only pay whenever the service or the function is triggered due to an event and that event can be a click of the user or uh, let's say submission of a form etc those are all called as events and the function will uh, give out outputs based on these events and in the image below i have given few of the function as a service providers among them are the top contenders that is aws lambda from amazon web service azure functions from uh, microsoft and uh, cloud functions from google apart from the top providers we also have uh, Knative by Kubernetes and uh, Cloudflare Workers is also a good alternative. Now an application stack or an app stack generally consists of uh, three layers and these three layers are compute, integration and uh, data stores. So you need uh, these three layers for your app to work and cloud providers provide solutions to all the three layers and more. So for example AWS or Amazon Web Service provides the following services for a serverless infrastructure. Now coming to the compute layer, uh, we have uh, AWS Lambda and AWS Fargate for microservices. And coming to the integration layer, we have Amazon API Gateway, uh, Step Functions, Event Bridge and many other services. For data stores, we have Amazon S3 that is Simple Storage Service and we also have Amazon DynamoDB. And apart from uh, these two storage services, we have many more according to the needs of the app. So now that we know uh, what all services uh, can be integrated to form a serverless computing environment, let us see a basic architecture which is uh, made by using uh, uh, services from the AWS and how it is implemented in this uh, demo app. So first of all, uh, your uh, front-end code is hosted on S3. That is, S3 is a service where uh, objects are stored any object is allowed to store and these objects include uh, let's say uh, HTML files, CSS files, JavaScript files, all that uh, working code is put onto the S3 and your users will access uh, the website uh, from the S3. So after loading uh, the website from S3 storage, so users will click uh, to get information or data 
and this request goes through some service called as Amazon API Gateway. So this basically is an endpoint for all your APIs put together and uh, your app makes a REST API call to the endpoint. So when the user clicks on the link, uh, it in turn gives out a REST API call and it goes through API Gateway and in turn it is given out to AWS Lambda. So Lambda contains your running or working code and Lambda will run the code and the land, Lambda in turn fetches uh, information from Amazon DynamoDB which contains all of your database and then uh, returns that output to API Gateway which in return gives out or displays on the screen of your user. So this is a simple architecture uh, where serverless computing is implemented. So apart from AWS, we also have uh, solutions or uh, services from Azure, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud. Now let us see the journey of serverless computing, how it came about. The deployment models have been evolving over the years. Let us walk through how we have got to serverless and the journey behind it. So as you can see in the diagram, first we started off with bare metal, that is the physical servers in uh, the company that is on premises of the company. And next we moved on to virtual machines followed by containers and uh, we are at serverless computing right now. Now let us look at each of them briefly. First we started off with uh, bare metal. In this deployment model, the process was to configure and manage the environment in the physical server in which you were supposed to deploy your code. That means you were uh, required to install the operating system, code environment, patching, managing, etc. So it was a very time consuming and a tedious task. Next, we moved on to virtual machines. Here it was resource optimized from the bare metal model where the idle times were handled much better. That means it was faster from uh, the bare metal models. But uh, in this model, we still had uh, deficiencies. That is, you still had to set up the environment, which did take a considerable amount of time. So down the road, we moved on to containers. Docker popularized the concept of containers. Here your application code along with its dependencies were packaged into uh, something called less containers. It simplified a lot of things from the deployment point of view, but at the same time it came down to scaling up apps. Uh, that means uh, when it uh, came to scaling up your apps, uh, the management of containers uh, became a challenge. So then uh, next we moved on to serverless, which is now uh, where we are right now. In this model, you, you are sort of abstracting from all the underlying infrastructure and uh, installing of your OS, configuring, all that stuff. You are abstracting from all of those tasks and you are focused mainly on writing code and business logic. So this is where we are right now. And there is still room for improvement. We will move ahead with the next topic that is need for serverless computing. In the early days of the web, anyone who wanted to build a web application had to own the physical hardware required to run a server, which is a time consuming and expensive task. As you can see, the guy is frustrated working with the bare metals infrastructure. And then uh, came the cloud uh, computing, where a fixed number of servers or amounts of server space could be rented remotely. Developers and companies who rented these fixed units of server space generally overpurchased to ensure that a spike in traffic or activity will not exceed their monthly limits and break their application. This means that much of the server space that gets paid for can go to waste. So some of these uh, examples of uh, virtual machines were Amazon EC2, Azure Virtual Machines, Google Compute Engine, etc. So next came serverless computing. So serverless computing allowed developers to purchase backend services on a flexible pay-as-you-go basis. Just a quick info guys, if you want to make a career in cloud and DevOps, then IntelliPad provides an advanced certification in cloud computing and DevOps by ENICT Academy IIT Roorkee. And it is taught by IIT Roorkee professors and industry experts. This course is designed to upskill and land your dream job. Now let's continue with the session. Meaning that the developers only have to pay for the services they use. This is like switching from a cell phone data plan with a monthly fixed limit to the one that only charges for each byte of data that actually gets used. So this is essentially saying that uh, serverless computing and uh, buying of uh, virtual servers is analogous to uh, your uh, mobile data plans wherein you switch from uh, prepaid to postpaid plans. 
So now, uh, looking at this graph, we have uh, the cost benefits of the serverless computing over uh, purchasing your own servers. So on the y-axis, we have cost and on the x-axis, we have uh, infrastructure, the scale of infrastructure. And uh, the diagonal line passing through the graph basically uh, means as the scale of the infrastructure increases, that is as in when you buy more equipments, that is traditional servers, your cost increases. And uh, the rectangles represent your purchasing of your uh, server. Each rectangle is representing purchasing of a new server. First, you start out with uh, one server, that is a rectangle which is small in size. And then two servers means a medium size rectangle and three is the largest rectangle. So let's say you're in a scenario wherein you have developed an app and you uh, expect a request of, um, let's say you expect 10 requests from your users each day. So you, uh, at the start, you won't purchase any servers. And let me just point that out for you. Okay. I hope you can see my uh, cursor pointer. So at the start, you won't purchase any uh, servers. You'll just basically be running on your own uh, personal computer or your office computer. So let's say you have to serve 10 uh, requests each day. So up until here, uh, you won't need any servers. But after, let's say, your users start, your app gets popular and uh, your users start to uh, send in more requests. So you, you are in a need to purchase a server right now. So you go ahead and buy a server or uh, purchase a virtual uh, machine. So you're wasting, essentially wasting this triangle, the blue triangle here, you're wasting this much amount of cost until your uh, requests reach uh, this point. Let's say one server is able to handle 100 requests. So up until uh, your, you get users and your users are uh, uh, pitching in or uh, asking for uh, 100 servers per day, you're wasting the server space. You're wasting the blue triangle here, right here. You're wasting this much of uh, server space and which in turn you're wasting cost. So let's say after 100, your app gets even more popular and uh, gets uh, more than 100 requests. So you are in need of another server, which has the capacity to serve 100 requests. So you buy one more server and uh, you waste uh, this much of uh, server space and costs until you reach 200 requests per day. So similarly, uh, you buy a third server uh, and you are not uh, reaching the limit or you are not optimally using three servers until you reach 300 requests per day. So you are essentially wasting one, two, three, three triangles worth of costs and server space uh, when you use traditional models or uh, virtual machines. But as if you choose serverless, you only pay uh, for each request, that is each computation or a function you perform. So this uh, gray area is for serverless, uh, which goes in for a smooth curve as compared to a jagged uh, rectangular edges. Uh, when compared to traditional servers or virtual machines. Now let us move on to the use cases of serverless computing. So given its unique combination of attributes and benefits, serverless architecture is well suited for uh, its use cases around microservices, mobile backends, and data and event stream processing. So uh, serverless computing basically favors uh, microservices, mobile backends, and uh, event stream processing uh, features. So as you can see in the diagram uh, given here, I have uh, mentioned uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, industries or six domains. And uh, each of these domains have a percentage of uh, the companies or the percentage of apps which is using serverless computing right now. So when it comes to customer relationship management, that is CRM applications, 37% uh, of the apps are using serverless computing right now. And 37% of them are using uh, serverless computing right now. And 36% of data analytics and business intelligence apps are using serverless computing. And uh, similarly, 31% of finance applications, 30% of database applications, 30% of HR applications, and so on. So, and this uh, share or uh, this market share will be expected to expand in the coming years. So now let us move on to the advantages of serverless computing. So the first advantage is you can move from your original idea to the market very fast. So this basically eliminates operational overhead so your team can release quickly, get feedback and iterate to get to the market very fast. 
it helps in building an mvp mvp is also known as uh, minimum viable product so you can uh, build your mvp uh, fast and cut out competition and get your app as soon as possible on the market model applications are built on the serverless environment first then if the app is successful it will be moved on to on premises servers this strategy prioritizes the adoption of serverless services so you can increase agility throughout your application stack so that was our first advantage our next advantage is a lowering of costs with a pay for value billing model resource utilization is automatically optimized and you never pay for over provisioning adapt at scale with the technologies that automatically scale from zero to peak demand you can adapt to customer needs faster than ever you can also build better applications very easy serverless applications have built in service integrations so that you can focus on building your application instead of configuring it so these were the four advantages of serverless computing so now let us move on to the last and final topic of today's video that is what's in store for serverless computing in the future now don't be alarmed uh, of this pic that i have put up it has a uh, an analogy coming up uh, shortly so serverless computing continues to evolve as serverless providers come up with solutions to overcome some of its drawbacks and one of these drawbacks is cold starts now let me just uh, revisit your memory and uh, tell you what cold start is in the real world that is in general what it means so this is why i have uh, put up an image of a car which is uh, frozen in snow and uh, remember this analogy so i will be using it to explain the cold start concept in serverless computing so the cold start concept while starting a car holds good here as you all know it takes time and extra fuel to start when the car engine is very cold but after the first time you start the car on that particular day subsequent uh, ignitions does not cost as much time that is your very first uh, ignition of the car will be time consuming and it also consumes more fuel and after that uh, you need not worry about the time it will start just fine which is also called as warm start so now coming back to the drawback of serverless computing that is cold starts typically when a particular uh, serverless function has not been called in a while that is you have put up your code in the serverless uh, environment and it has not been called in a while the provider shuts down the function to save energy and avoid over provisioning the next time a user or a client runs an application that calls the function the serverless provider will have to spin it up fresh and start hosting that function again so this startup time adds significant latency which is also known as a cold start once the function is up and running it will be served much more rapidly on subsequent requests which is also known as warm starts but if the function is not requested again for a while the function will once again go dormant and you need to cold start it again cloud providers are working on solving these issues uh, and coming up with better iterations of serverless computing we will have to wait and watch what the future has in store for serverless computing thank you for watching till the end guys have a nice day just a quick info guys if you want to make a career in cloud and devops then intellipad provides an advanced certification in cloud computing and devops by enict academy iit roorkee and it is taught by iit roorkee professors and industry experts this course is designed to upskill and land your dream job